tonight. Slowing down, India sees voter numbers dip following the second phase of elections as heat waves cause even more difficulties with polling. Tense talks. US President Joe Biden speaks to Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Rafah and its future, staying firm on humanitarian grounds. Tit for tat. Biden takes a jab at his Republican rival Donald Trump as Trump throws down the glove in an invitation to debate. And cat out the box. One feline takes herself on a voyage of six days as a nap in the wrong carrier carries her to California. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you very much for joining us this lovely Monday evening. Now with the week kicking off, we saw lots of updates on the situation of the entire world. From the US with its diplomacy with Israel and also on some weather woes that are playing out in varying nations. But we start off tonight in our region in neighboring India with their election process. The second phase of India's national election, the world's biggest, concluded over the weekend amid flagging voter turnout. Approximate voter turnout data at the end of polling put the turnout at 61%, lower than the 65% in the first phase last week and 68% in the second phase five years ago. In Uttar Pradesh, just over 50% of voters turned out to vote compared to over 60% in 2019. There are seven phases in India's national election and attention will be now turned to the third round scheduled for May 7th. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is expected to win a historic third term on the back of the issues such as growth, welfare and hardline Hindu nationalism. Meanwhile, polling slowed as parts of India sweltered in a heat wave with mercury exceeding 44 degrees Celsius in some parts of the state. But the climate seems to be tumultuous, specifically in our region. India's voters battled heat waves to get to the polls, and the Philippines as well is seen to be suffering under similar conditions. Sweltering heat in the Philippines is threatening to curb farm production, disrupt water and power, and weigh on businesses. But it also takes a massive toll on students, hampering the Southeast Asian nation's efforts to catch up to its neighbors in education. Heat indices says it's felt like a whopping 122 degrees Fahrenheit in parts of the Philippines in recent days, as El Nino ratchets up humid summer heat that began in March. As a result, thousands of schools have suspended classes because of sweltering temperatures, affecting more than 3.6 million students, according to official data. It's another in a series of obstacles facing children in the Philippines. According to an international study of education systems, it scores among the lowest in the world in maths, science and reading, partly because of years of inadequate remote learning during the pandemic. 23-year-old student Kurt Mahuse is a senior in high school after his education stalled during lockdowns. Now, he says the heat is unbearable. It's part of a band of heat spreading across South and Southeast Asia this year exacerbated by El Nino and climate change, and it makes it harder for children to simply learn. According to Save the Children Philippines, children are particularly vulnerable to heat-related illnesses including dizziness, vomiting and fainting when exposed to extreme heat for long periods. And high school teacher Medea Santos says it's become a struggle to get through the workday. Local media say the relentless heat is not expected to dissipate and has a 50% chance of intensifying this week. Students and teachers are worried about how much more learning they will lose out on, especially in areas where access to gadgets and the internet is sporadic and sparse. The state weather agency on Monday forecasts that temperatures in the area around Manila could reach nearly 100 degrees in the next three days, while the heat index, what the body actually feels, is expected to remain higher at a record 113 degrees in the range which it classifies as dangerous because conditions can trigger heat stroke from prolonged exposure. 
Now we are on with updates on the chaos in Haiti now. Haiti's transitional presidential council has taken over in what many hope marks a first step towards returning security to a country where escalating gang control has plunged millions into a humanitarian crisis. But some Haitians are skeptical that it will rarely make a difference. This is what a normal day looks like in the Haitian capital. Armored vehicles and heavily armed police patrol the streets of Port-au-Prince. It's hoped Haiti's new transitional presidential council will bring an end to the anarchy that has swept the country. Thursday, almost three years after President Jovenel Moïse was assassinated, its nine members were sworn in. But residents of the capital, grown used to gang warfare, are skeptical it will make a difference. Both the US and the UN have welcomed the swearing in of the new transitional government, but they've also urged its members to announce a credible series of policies. All nine of the council's members have the unenviable task of bringing order and stability to a country that has fallen apart, where gangs hold power. For years, armed gangs have been running rampant in Haiti. Roughly 150 criminal groups operate in Port-au-Prince alone. Haiti's security forces, under-equipped and short-staffed, are simply no match for the gangs, who control 80% of the capital. And on some diplomatic updates now, the Kremlin has shrugged off a trip to China by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, during which he raised concerns about Chinese support for Russia's military, saying Moscow and Beijing would continue to develop their own ties. Blinken raised concerns about China's support for Russia's military, one of many issues threatening to sour the recent improvement in relations between the world's biggest economies. Despite its no-limits partnership with Moscow, China has steered clear of providing arms for Russia war in Ukraine, but Blinken said its supply of so-called dual-use goods was having a material effect in Ukraine. China has said it has not provided weaponry to any party and is not a producer or of a party involved in the Ukraine crisis. However, it says that normal trade between China and Russia should not be interrupted or restricted. And still in Russia, the conflict in Ukraine continues as both sides have claimed attacking each other's energy facilities and military targets in the past days. This comes as there are reports that enlistments to the Ukrainian forces seem to dwindle at an almost exponential rate. For more on this situation, we have other than news. Special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Sanuradi. The Ukrainian army conducted strikes on Russian personnel and military equipment along with radar stations, air defense systems, electronic warfare platforms and material warehouses. Ukraine claimed that multiple energy facilities were hit by the missiles resulting in severe damage. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said that the European Union's energy security depends on these energy facilities and Ukraine needs at least seven more sets of Patriot air defense systems to bolster its defense capabilities. Senior US military officials said that due to the extensive use of Russian drones for reconnaissance and targeting of Ukrainian tanks, the US provided Abrams tank that have been withdrawn from the frontline battlefield in Ukraine. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. We're going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're in the U.S. now with some more diplomatic strategies at play, this time on a different conflict. President Biden met with Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the future of operations in Gaza. According to senior Israeli defense officials, Israel plans to evacuate Palestinian civilians from Rafah and launch an assault on Hamas holdouts there. But Washington insists on a credible humanitarian strategy before supporting it. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday and, quote, reiterated his clear position on a possible invasion of the Gaza border city of Rafah. Israel's military is poised to evacuate Palestinian civilians from Rafah and assault Hamas holdouts there, according to comments last week by a senior Israeli defense official. 
The invasion would come despite international warnings of a humanitarian catastrophe. Washington has said it could not support a Rafah operation without an appropriate and credible humanitarian plan. The White House in a statement also said that Biden and Netanyahu reviewed talks designed to secure the release of some of the Israeli hostages, coupled with an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Meanwhile, a Hamas delegation is set to visit Cairo on Monday for talks aimed at securing a ceasefire, according to a Hamas official. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is also set to meet with regional partners this week on a trip to Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Israel. His trip to the region comes after reported that some senior U.S. officials have questioned whether Israel is using U.S.-supplied weapons in accordance with international humanitarian law. According to an internal State Department memo reviewed, some top officials advised Blinken they do not find Israel's assurances on the matter, quote, credible or reliable. Other U.S. officials accepted Israel's assurances. Blinken must report to Congress by May 8th on whether he finds Israel's assurances credible that its use of U.S. weapons does not violate U.S. or international law. And on the road to the White House tonight, former U.S. President Donald Trump told reporters at Manhattan Criminal Court that he had invited President Biden to debate him on national television. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden took jabs at his Republican rival as he delivered an election year roast at the annual White House Correspondents Association dinner as protesters outside criticized his support for Israel's war against Hamas. Biden used the annual black tie event to chide his Republican rival Donald Trump for immaturity, poke fun at his own advanced age and take on a Washington press corps. Biden also referred to Trump's criminal trial over hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels. With the 2024 US presidential election looming, Biden struggles in polls to defeat Trump, who is now the Republican frontrunner. Trump also responded to Biden's off-the-cuff remarks on wanting to debate his rival. Despite both sides showing eagerness, there seems to be more conviction landed by the Republican frontrunner on the initiation of a debate. Well, the U.S. is also facing some weather woes tonight. At least four people died, including a four-month-old baby, and scores were injured in Oklahoma this weekend after dozens of twisters swept the U.S. southern plains, while weather alerts put more than seven million Americans under tornado warnings. This is the town of Sulphur after a tornado stormed through it on Saturday night. Buildings and trees leveled and tens of thousands of residents left without electricity. There were several people killed in the Oklahoma town, including a four-month-old baby. Scenes of devastation that astounded the state's governor. What I saw downtown, sulfur, uh, it's un unbelievable. I spoke with the administrator of FEMA uh, earlier today, and uh, she offered her assistance. I told her to thank the president. We're working on uh, the damage assessment. We have Anna with... Um, the emergency management department, she'll be working on all that. Uh, the federal government will help these people. The region was also hit by heavy flooding. The governor declared a disaster emergency, freeing up more money for first responders and recovery efforts. Public representatives vowed the state would stand with sulfur. The U.S. Weather Service on Sunday issued tornado warnings for 47 million people from East Texas to Illinois and Wisconsin, forecasting 38 possible tornadoes in Oklahoma alone. Well, the 2024 Games in Paris are coming closer with each passing day. The Olympic flame began its journey to France on board the Belém, leaving the Greek port of Peru, after spending the night at the French embassy in Athens. Cheers and applause for the big send-off. C'est magique, en fait. C'est magique. After being carried to the Belém, a 19th century boat, by the Paris Olympics chief organizer, the flame left the port of Piraeus. It's a historic departure, taking place under the watchful eyes of crew members and 16 apprentice sailors, who are touched to be guardians of the flame. 
It's very emotional. The whole show and ceremony is also very moving. And now the flame is finally aboard the Belém. It's been handed to us and we'll treasure it. At 10 a.m., the ship set sail for France. All hands were on deck. Meanwhile, the captain left the boat. Belém headed away from Greece, accompanied by dozens of boats as it began its Mediterranean crossing. Many French people flocked to the quay to watch the event. It's a unique opportunity to see something wonderful because the boat is truly fantastic. Seeing the Olympic flame leaving Greece to head to France is really symbolic. On board, the first exercises came one after the other, including lifting the sail under the supervision of the commander. Now in his eighth year at the helm, he says it's a source of great pride. I never thought that I'd be commander of the Belém, even as a kid. When they told me, I said, I don't believe it. And on top of that, transporting the flame, that's incredible. Belém will be home to the flame for the next 11 days, until its arrival in Marseille on May the 8th. Let's go for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Now, if you have encountered any feline in your lifetime, it is very easy to tell that it's a common trait that cats love climbing into boxes. But this particular kitty clearly aimed for a nice nap and picked the wrong one. It was an Amazon box and so the poor thing ended up being shipped out on a six day journey. This sweet cat has gone missing. Her owners are frantic. We could not find her anywhere. And she's an indoor cat. She usually is my buddy and stays right next to me all the time. Carrie Clark's cat, Galena, vanished from her home in Utah. Carrie and husband Matt searched everywhere. We made up flyers. We plastered them across all of the neighborhoods around us. Six days later, just when they were losing hope, the couple received a stunning phone call. The cat Galena had been found in a box at an Amazon return center 650 miles away in Riverside, California. It was a pretty, pretty intense moment in the warehouse when they opened her box and out popped a kitty cat. Many of them thought, from what I heard, that like, what kind of sick person ships their cat in the mail? It turns out Galena had hidden in this Amazon box that was filled with shoe returns. We realized that she must have jumped into our package without us knowing. And, you know, like the saddest thing in the entire world, we, we literally took her to the UPS store and she was shipped out to California. Like, it's awful. Upon discovering Galena, a kind-hearted Amazon employee immediately took her to a vet. We've gotten some strange things, but definitely never, never a live cat. Her eyes were the largest eyes I've ever seen on a cat before. She was, she was petrified. Good girl. Imagine six days without water or food, and she's still alive. Carrie and Matt quickly jumped on a red-eye flight. Here's the emotional moment they're reunited with Galena. I told you mommy, daddy were coming. Can you say hi? And here's Galena today, totally recovered from that wild Amazon box adventure. But the story sounds like something straight out of a Madagascar movie, honestly. Thankfully, the journey allowed a safe passage back home for the poor kitty. But that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.